All right, guys, welcome to the next level call and uh, live video. Appreciate you jumping on. Very excited to hear from Matt Smith today. He's going to carry us after I read some numbers, go over some housekeeping things. He's going to carry us the entire call. The sales, training, mortgage, final expense is also going to pick up the end with the annuity and the IUL. And if you've not heard uh, Matt train, you're certainly in for a, a treat today. So thank you for, for tuning in, jumping on, and, and uh, we know how busy everybody is. I'm going to get right to the numbers. Then I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the VPs we have for the month and give you some other give, uh, indicators of where we are year to date. So the first week of November, this is the Submit Leaderboard. So we do everybody over $15,000. We have a couple carrier reps that keep coming in and out, and we have some out, out here, and I was going over these numbers with them. And um, we have some carriers been working with for a while, some that we're, we're, we're looking to do some things with, and, and I, was, I was showing them this. I said, look at this, and, and, and one of the reps said, That's, what is that? And I said, those are the weekly Submit numbers. And I had to explain it because it sounds so inordinate. We had some people in here this week. We had to do the same thing because they don't understand. You know, we're we're gonna our goal next month is to issue in a month. I know Mike Sizer is trying to hedge bets a little bit. Seven million in life business for the month, which we know we can do, and we're on track. And and we're certainly well over 150 this year. A million in paid business, life and annuity business. So. Tiffany G submitted 16,948, Ryan M 17,000, Zach C 17,484, Jonathan P 17,495, Galen W 18,512, Rhonda S 19,400, John M 20,475. You have to give me that timer, Mike. Um, Conrad P 22,504, Charles H 23,250. Nice job. Ivan V 23,766, Jake D 24,676. Pete O, 25,203. Yes, these are weekly numbers. Jerry T, 26,800. Todd S, 27,108. Brandon L, 29,000. Uh, Millie P, 30,639. Ray D, 33,193. Spencer F, 34,000. Amy M, 37,127. And Brian R, 84,000 submitted for the week. We had five people submit over $30,000 for the week. Um, Organizations, everybody over 100 grand. FFL United, 169928. Golden State, 169823. East Coast, 196204. USA, 223164. Northwest, 261205. Global, 325110. West Coast, 356697. Tri State, 433164. Gulf Coast, 524058. And Southeast submitted $782,290 in premium this week alone. Uh, issue paid. We do everybody over ten grand for the week. Justin H, ten thousand four hundred seven. Louis L, ten thousand seven four three. Christina B, ten thousand eight nine nine. Josh L, eleven thousand two forty. Brandon L, eleven thousand nine one one. John D, twelve thousand three two six. Andrew I, twelve thousand three two eight. Conrad P, twelve thousand three nine three paid. Nicole M, twelve thousand four one four. Zach T, thirteen thousand one zero four. Ivan V, fourteen thousand forty four. Alvern V, 14,130. Dawn S, 14,133. John P, 14,164 paid. We had six people issue over 20,000 for the week. Uh, Samuel H, 21,489. Piotr O, 29,879. John Gav, 33,254. Bradley A, 40,196. Christina B, 43,419. And Danielle B, $74,536 issued for the week. So she issued three times more than the average agent issues in a year. In a week, um, average, Limra, stats, 30 grand, kind of $25,000 a year. Uh, top five life only, Nicole M, 12414 Zach T, 13104 Ivan V, 14044 John P, 14164 Samuel H, 21489 Contracted agents for the week, give you an idea. Obviously, we're on a big push contracting. Um, you've heard me talk about, we looked at the numbers today, Mike, what we're doing, life volume in January, three million and change? Yeah, 3.7. 3.7, and now we're knocking on the door of seven million paid in life, in a life only in a month. Contracted agents, we weren't contracting 20 people a week in January, we just, now we have this machine from an infrastructure standpoint and what we're doing and that we've been doing it for five years and that you know we've got a lot of these things in place and understand the independence and the training and how we put people in position to win and the numbers don't lie they just are what they are um you, know, you can jump up and down all you want but if you don't have the numbers the real numbers then it, that doesn't matter 
Um, FFL Maryland contracted seven people this week. United eight, West Coast 10, Global 11, Southeast 13, Northwest 18, Golden State 19, East Coast 21, Tri-State 22. Family First Life USA contracted 59 agents this week alone. So outstanding job. I want to read you the VPs real quick too, and then we'll uh, give you a couple pieces of information and we'll turn it over to Matt. Um, we had 40 people, sales manager and above for the month, and I will buzz through them really quick. We also went through average IP per agent, which is really neat, and we're doing that in the VP call later and some other things that we're doing, just so people kind of see where everybody stands and what they're doing. And when you look at our company, uh, we're right around that average agent issuing right around $9,000 a month. Average. That's brand new. I wrote one app this week, or on part-time. That's the average person, and obviously we have an inordinate amount of people that are um, over you know, the twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars that you should pay for a month. Priscilla C, congratulations. First time sales manager, I believe. Eighty thousand three four seven. Brandon L, hundred thousand three nine four. Travis M, hundred four five four two. Millie P, one zero three four zero seven. Nick A, one zero four zero five seven. Leticia M, one eleven three four six. Gary P, one twelve eight two four. Terry H, one fifteen one five nine. Vanina B, one fifteen two eight six. Grady P, 115-443. Zach E, 117-220. Nice job, Zach. Been here for, I don't know, six, seven months. Todd S, 131-516. Jermaine C, 137-188. Victor V, 145-128. Joseph M, 146-793. Those are all our sales managers. So, 75 grand above, below 150. We had 24 VPs for the month. Eric A, nice job, buddy. 154-834. Paid. Wayne C, congratulations. First time VP, 158-060. Conrad, 166196. Amy M, 166340. Albert L, 179812. Albert's also been with us six, seven months, maybe even less. John Gav, 179842. Brian M, 194831. Paid. Mickey T, 212332. Trey H, 232303. Athena V, 242216. Danielle B, 246139. Jack Y, 25220. Galen W, 263572. Frank E, 303377. Ryan M, 320-037. Dominique R, 425-434. Matthew John Smith, 498-075. John W, 831-112. We had six organizations issue over a million for the month. So they issued a million dollars for the month. Um, Drew J, 1,180,917. Mark M, 1,223,850. Andrew T, 1,242,942. Paul M, 1,525408. Brant A, 1,561561. And Michael K, 2,337181. One of the things you're going to hear today when you listen to Matt talk, and I'm going to preempt his training a little bit to, to help you understand the things I've learned from him and the things we've learned as an organization. We have an insanely, um, and when I say insanely um, presumptive sales approach, we understand the psychology behind our client. Um, we're not enamored by people that walk in the door and tell us how unbelievable they are at selling people stuff. Um, we want to help folks. That's what we want to do. You know, I, I was a social worker 15 years. I liked helping people. I didn't like the job I had. I didn't necessarily like the, the compensation I had and the, the freedom I didn't have, but I like helping people. If we can go help people and put them in a better position to win, then we're going to do that. We're launching some things here. We just did a call yesterday with a large group, some other things that we're launching product-wise that are going to benefit our clients even more, and we'll release that to you guys over the next week or two. Um, but one of the things I heard from Matt early on when he was talking, and, and it struck me on both mortgage final expense, IUL annuities didn't matter, was his understanding of who he was dealing with. See, when you listen to Matt talk today, you have to take a step back, and you have to understand that he's crystal clear in knowing who he's speaking to. He knows who his audience is. He knows that every single one of them reached out and said they needed help, so he doesn't treat them any other way. He's somebody that talks to you about, I mean, he's changed our game as far as, you know, when you look at premium. One of the things we talked about when these, you know, these trial closes he has and how he's always in control of the appointment. And by the way, we're all different, just so you know. So, so people go like, well, she says this or he says that. I can't do exactly that. You don't need to. You need to be able to be you. You need to find the place that you fit. But the things that are universal that he's talking about are the control and the appointment, the structure that he provides, the things that he says, the jokes that he makes at his own expense, the sense of humor that he, that he provides. Because at the end of the day, what are people looking for? They want to make sure they can trust you, that they're, you're not going to like take their money and it's, you're going to be honest, you're going to put them in a better position when you're not going to lie to them about the product. The product is going to be the product. I mean, this is life insurance. This isn't a game. This isn't like we're selling desk chairs. If I sit in this chair or another chair, it really doesn't matter what chair I fit in. Sit in. It might be a little more comfortable. It's not going to dramatically change my life. 
we need to put people in the best possible position to be protected. How do we go in there not know anything about somebody and learn the things that listen to what Matt talks about? How does he learn those things? Well, he's a good question asker and he's a very good listener. Silence can be a killer in a very good way. When somebody's in a position where they're trying to make a decision, I think when you listen to the way Matt had, goes about his presentation and the things he talks about in the home, and he's gonna talk about yourself, he's gonna talk about you know that self-development stuff is important. And it's not important that you sit around and read books all day long about it and not go to work, because again, the best book for, for your self-image is work, W-O-R-K, W-O-R-K, there's nothing better than that, but for him, it's how do, you, how do you go ahead and put yourself in a position when you wake up in the morning throughout your day where you really understand you, understand your client, and I think more importantly, when life is knocking you around, when things aren't going perfect, you know, you're, you have stuff in your life just like everybody else does, when that happens to you, how do you deal with it? Because at the end of the day, it's never as bad as you think it is, and it's never as good as you think it is. So you know, that's the whole deal with with independent contractors. I think when you're when you're raised, and I was, I was raised very much. My mom was just trying to make ends meet day to day, week to week, month to month. And true success in my mom's eyes was paying your bills and just going to work. And you know, for for independent contractors, when they actually start making money, and Matt talked, when they start making money, you don't use your bank account as your barometer anymore for you because there's so many other things you can go do. You're already making money. You're already paying your bills. You're investing money. You're putting things away. You're thinking about your future. So that doesn't mean you stop just because you're able to do those things now. It means that you can expect more out of life and you expect more financially for your family and you can put yourself in a better position to win. So those are important things to understand about Matt Smith when you hear him talk because I always, I never want to lose sight when somebody goes to eat and no matter who I listen to, it doesn't mean I can say exactly that, that exact way. The way I talk is different than all of you. You all talk differently than me. Good, bad, and different. It doesn't matter. It's who you are. So you have to acknowledge who you are, strengths, weaknesses, things you're going to be good at, Listen to Matt talk about it. I promise you will change your sales. I promise you help make more money. Here's my buddy Matt Smith. Thank you, Sean, for having me on the next level of call. My name is Matt Smith, and I've got a variety of topics that's going to help you today. We're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, usually we're covering some nuts and bolts. I want to take a step outside of the business and give you some things to think about, whether it's on the phone or in the home that you can start to implement because I know that this is a thinking person's game and we can all evolve and get better as, as the time goes on. The one thing that I want to make sure you do before we get started though, Mike Sizer and I were talking about this, if you could just start pounding the like button, pound the like button, make some comments, share it with your friends, it could change your business. Last time that I was on the Next Level Call, I did the exact same thing. And I have a tremendous person in licensing, for example, just got licensed, just passed his test. And what if he makes six figures for his family and he changes his life and I'm able to help him do that? Well, that's a win-win. So the reason why your business is so small is we're not sharing this with, with your whole network of friends and family and connections that you have. So like and share it with Facebook. Get us out there. We're, we're expanding. We're growing. And we want everybody to be a part of it. So... The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about people skills. There's going to be 20 different people skills that we discuss. I'm going to break it into two segments of 10. And your job is to grab a pen. And I only really want you to focus on two. Two of these 10 and two of the next 10 that you can look at and say, you know what, Matt? I need to improve. That's an area I need to improve. Anytime I look at myself and look at some of these things, that I need to work on it is a reminder on areas that can can help improve your business because I know one thing we all can get better so starting with people skills the first one that I would say is important this is not in a specific order is your ability to relate to others so you have to know how to build value with you your product your service that's very important but you also need to understand if you're meeting with a doctor or a physician or the blue collar or the white collar or a topic in religion or a topic in business or work related things, you need to be able to relate with others because at the end of the core of, of sales, you need to be likable. Being likable is where you're going to be able to relate with others. So your ability to maybe agree or disagree with like a mutual respect is very important when we're talking about re relating with, with others. The next thing is you have to have strong communication skills. So everybody loves to hear their names. When Sean Mike started this call, he was going through names, correct? So everybody likes to hear their name. So make sure 
you take the focus off of you as the producer and focus on them as the client. And, and you got to understand people's favorite word to hear is their name. So if you can, if you can show that to them, that's extremely important. So put them in the middle of the sale. I'll never forget, like, uh, when I first started this business a decade ago, I was sitting with a, a client and I was talking about my, my young two year old daughter at the time. And I was showing pictures of my daughter to the client. And all of a sudden he said, really, I got, let me show you pictures of my granddaughters because they're, they're beautiful too. And I realized, what am I doing? Like, I'm making this about me, not them. I'm so excited about want to share something about my daughter. They don't care about me and my family. I'm here for them. So you got to have some self-awareness and understand that you need to put them in the picture because they need to know that you're, you generally have care for them. So make sure that you're putting them in the middle of the picture. Um, patience with others. So as a sales producer, we're always going to be tested with different personalities, different situations. So when you're under stress, the way that you deal with it is going to really determine whether you can dictate and get a sale or not. Because you're going to meet people, and we'll talk about that later on in this presentation. You're going to meet different types of personal personality types where they're going to try to push your put buttons. And your job is to not bring the emotion into the sale from your standpoint. We'll, we'll talk about emotion later and how it's effective in the sale, but you can't get emotional based off of them pushing your button. So just be patient, understand that it's a part of the process and work through it with your clients. The next one is your ability to earn your client's trust. So obviously without trust, can't get a sale. And we'll talk about this as well, but you've got to talk about you, your product, your company, and how you're different from everyone else. That's the best way that you can really increase the value and, and make sure that they trust you as an individual. Um, knowing when to show empathy is extremely important. So you need to make sure that you can put yourself in, in your client's shoes because once you do that and they understand that you're doing that, they're going to see a lot more value in you because then they know that you understand their circumstances. Let me give you a good example of a scenario that I did this week. So I sat down with a client and inside of the financial inventory, I started to talk to them about their jobs and their income, etc. And the wife said, yeah, I'm actually, my, my contract is ending and I make $83,000 and my contract ends and I will not have a job in three months. And we're, we are concerned about that. So I took the approach of, of selling the bread earner, the, the, the husband at the time, a policy. I put a joint accidental death policy on him as well. But I didn't cover her because she actually had some current life insurance that was permanent al already. And I, I said, listen, because, you know, I'm conscious of your budget, because it's coming up here, let's stay within within your budget right now that we know you can afford based off of his income versus both your income. Cause the last thing I need is in three months, you not to be able to afford it. So let's wait till we know exactly what you're doing. And then we'll, we'll get another policy on you. Does that make sense, Mary? Yes, it does. So it was able to see, I'm not all about my commission and why I'm here, etc. I was able to put myself in their shoes and say, okay, if I had a spouse that was losing their job, pretty significant amount of income, the husband really wanted to be covered, so we, we took care of that, put a joint policy on for some accidental death as well, so we we're walking out with multiple policies. But still, I was able to really earn their trust by saying, hey, I understand what you're dealing with. Here's the process that we'll take. I'm your agent for life. I'm going to be here. I have no problem with, you know, give me a call here in about three to six months, and we'll put something together based off of what your new job is. Does that make sense? Yes. Right now, we're going to take care of this. So showing empathy is a big part of sales and, and take, take a look at that as well. So you also have to have active listening skills. So active listening skills is the best way to build rapport. Um, I think I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because this is important. So some of you, especially newer agents, what I see that spends hours in the house, two hours in the house, you think rapport is spending 30 minutes talking about their fishing trip. That is not rapport. That's where you're going wrong. And that is where you lose control. So you've, you've got to understand a couple things. First of all, 
people are going to judge you off your appearance in the first four to seven seconds. So this is where rapport starts. So if they view you as a weak individual, they're going to try to take control of the circumstance and say, just give me the price. I filled this out for information. And if you don't show them that you're in control of the circumstances and you're the person with all the knowledge, experience, etc., you'll lose control. You'll lose the sale right off the bat. With active listening skills, it's the best way to live, have, have control and it's the best way to build rapport because here's what I'd say. Many of you, I've done this too, I've done it both ways. Um, I think the most effective way to build rapport is during financial inventory. While you're taking and gathering all that personal information from your client, those are when easy questions can start to come out and rapport is more natural. The problem with some of you is when you start to build rapport in the beginning of the, of the conversation, it's not genuine. You're asking maybe very generic questions that don't matter. You can start to ask better questions about their job, where they met, who asked who out first, scenarios like that inside of gathering that pers personal information. And here's how rapport works. It works with that nonverbal communication. You'll say, mm-hmm, yes, okay. That makes sense. Once you start giving them the, hmm, yes, okay, great. That makes sense. That active listening skills where there's a big difference between hearing, right, and listening. So what you need to do is stop, listen to what your clients are saying, and then reply. And reply with making sure that you understand that you're on target with what they're saying. Because if you're just like, yeah, okay, and you're writing it down and you, mm -hmm, yeah, and you're don't, you don't really show any sort of interest, there will be no rapport. And without those simple, basic things of rapport, you will not get the sale. So make sure that you're engaging with your client with rapport saying, mm -hmm, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Oh, where'd you meet? Oh, you know, mm, yeah. All those things. Because those, those are the small wins that maybe you're not doing. Because what will happen is what, when you get outside of that financial inventory, it's time to talk about the product and how it's going to make sense. They're already sold because they already know that you're an expert. They already know that you care about them. So, so this is that, that rapport is such a big deal and knowing when to do it, you do it at the same time inside the financial inventory. You don't have to come in and, and feel awkward with people skills in the middle of the house, unless it's just a natural scenario. Sometimes you're going to click with people and it's just going to be natural and it's okay. So there's, I'm not saying there's a finite, you know, definite formula that you have to follow. I would just recommend rapport building is better off. When you, after you set the table, you talk to them and you're gathering information inside the financial inventory and make sure you're engaging and let them know that you're interested in making it about them, et cetera. So that's super important as, as well. Um, next thing is genuine, genuine interest in others. So I've met so many people where they're like, man, I'm terrible at remembering names. If you're terrible at remembering names with your clients, you're going to lose once again. And what I mean by this is you got to remember names. You've got to remember dates. You've got to remember significant things that have happened with them. And then you need to repeat it to them because that's the way they'll know you care. So what I've seen happen in sales is people say, man, I'm really bad, especially when you're running multiple appointments. Like the thing I really, really focus on is making sure I know John and Mary's name the whole time and making sure I'm calling them by, by John and Mary the entire time. Because those, once again, everything adds up. It's super important. The worst thing is, is when you call them by the wrong name or when you forgot their name and they, you, you can't use it. So these are small things. They seem like, oh, it's no, it's no, it's no big deal. We need to talk about it all. I'm trying to talk about it all. I'm trying to break down all the little stuff for you today. Not because this is a complicated sale. I'm just trying to give you a step back, give you more of a 10,000 foot view of sales and let you know what works and what doesn't work. And maybe you need to identify a few things and say, okay, I'm going to implement that. I'm going to try that next time in, I'm in the field. So remembering dates, I, uh, I got no show. Well, rescheduled on uh, the previous week with a client. And when I went back, I, I said, I remember you told me you went to, to Evergreen High School. 
right? He's like, oh yeah, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. He said, and when we were rescheduling because he lived close to my parents' house, etc., where I grew up, and we just got in a conversation about where we went to high school, etc. And he's like, yeah, I went to you know, high school, and yeah, you said all your kids are out of your house, and and it's just you and your spouse right now, and you're you're gathering a bunch of toys and all this stuff, and you just bought that motorcycle. How'd your and you bought that truck? How'd your truck purchase go? So I had genuine rapport when I went back and 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 met with that client, and let me tell you something, they, they bought, they both bought. You know what I mean? So that's remembering names and dates and important things from your clients. They will know you care and it will set you apart from the competition. The competition doesn't do it like us, I promise you. So make sure that you're you're setting yourself uh, apart as well. So flexibility. Uh, you need to have flexibility inside of different topics that will come up because what will happen is um, clients will get you off track. And your job is to stay on track for time's sake, for structure and control. So you need to have the flexibility to talk about whatever topic comes up, but you also need to make sure that you get back to the course. Because again, rapport is not talking for 10 minutes at a time or 30 minutes at a time about their hobby or their favorite or their truck or whatever. Rapport is acknowledge it. Hey, that's a nice new truck. Yeah, I like it. That's, that thing's sweet. So anyways, where, where'd you, where do you work currently? You see what I'm saying? It's like you get back into control. It's, it's such a big deal, but you've got to be flexible. So if something gets thrown at you, your, your game isn't thrown off and you don't know how to respond. So being flexible is a, uh, a big thing as well. So uh, good judgment. This, this comes from, you know, usually your gut feeling. Um, the best example that I can give you for good judgment in, in pertains to insurance sales. A lot of new people fail at this is underwriting. If a client is not eligible for a product, make sure that you are not going to offer them something that they can't get. A lot of times, salespeople will come in and they'll say, hey, uh, we, you know, I, I made this sale and they're not eligible. They could get maybe a final expense product would have been better versus maybe a mortgage protection product that they weren't eligible for. So use your, as a producer, if you feel like they can't get qualified, Go with what you think they can actually get qualified for because I see that mistake time and time again. For example, if they're a oral diabetic and they're over a 7.0 on their H1AC, they're probably going to be a final expense client because it won't be accepted for simplified issue in, in most cases. I'm using that example. So understand how underwriting works. Understand how important it is to call your upline, call your manager while you're in the house, if you have a health scenario that you're not familiar with, and, and I think you'll find it better off. But use your gut feeling, and, and you'll know how to, how to translate that as, as well. Um, ability to persuade others. The ability to persuade others is really comes down to one important thing, and that is your belief. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover certainty later on in this, in this topic. But in order for you to persuade someone, they have to know that you believe in the product, you believe in the, in the company, you believe it's the best thing from them. And we'll talk about that and, and how that works here in a few minutes. So here is the group of the last 10 that I want you to focus on and look at and maybe take two of them uh, from the first little session to here. Take a look at them, implement it, see if it works for you. And I think you'll find some good results in the house. You need to first look at uh, your negotiating skills. So a lot of times when we're doing top-down selling, the way that you are able to navigate through the sale, the way that you are able to uh, get something versus nothing at all is, is, is extremely important. Let me give you an example. So a lot of times we'll sit down with a client that maybe wants their mortgage protected for the entire amount, but we can only sell them a final expense policy. Your ability to build value in small face amounts to those older clients to make sure that they have enough time to make some good financial decisions, whether they reverse the mortgage, whether they make payments and pull the equity out of the house, whether they use it as a down payment or refinance, you're giving them options versus nothing at all. So a lot of times when you're doing your top-down selling, sometimes you've got to realize that you're going to scrape them off the wall. Maybe the price is extremely too high. But if you do a proper financial inventory, you should have a pretty good feeling 
on what the top down should look like, if that makes sense. But in order for you to get better at this job, you need to make sure to be able to sell those smaller face amounts and, and have some extreme uh, success there as, as well. Uh, the next thing that I would say is your ability to keep an open mind. So in order to get trust with others, they need to make sure that their viewpoint and, and whatever, whatever their thoughts are, are being considered by you. The worst thing that you can do in a sales environment is not really listen to the clients, not have that empathy that we spoke about where you put yourself in, in their shoes and you're able to, to, to do something with it, but you literally just don't see their point of view, you would completely ignore it, and then you press your agenda on them. How you are able to build a lot of trust and a, and a lot of value with clients is when they see that that point of view has been considered and you can show them, even if, even if it's off of their opinion, you can show them why it makes financial sense to why you're showing them the products and services that we're, we're going over. So that's extremely important. Hey, here's my secret weapon is a sense of humor. So this goes back to out of college. Uh, my family owns the world's largest Dodge Chrysler dealership and I did F&I there for the first eight years. I was the number one F&I guy in the country for eight years, seven years in a row. And um, I remember that I was working with a lot of real good closers, better than me, I would say. They had the right word tracks. They had the right... You know, they, had, they could overcome any objection. They were maybe smoother than I was, etc. But I was closing and cl collecting a lot more premium than they were. And one of the reasons why I would attribute to that is I would always get people to relax with saying some maybe self-deprecating jokes or have a sense of humor. Because if you can inject humor into it, it releases that tension to the buyer. And all of a sudden they're relaxed, they're easy to make a buying decision. I would tell you, now don't get goofy, don't be a goofball, but uh, you need to understand that if you can get that, that humor into your closing, you're better off that way, and I think you'll, you'll find people are relaxed and they'll make that buying decision, and you're a little more likable. And you've gotta also ha have enough uh, of, of ability to say, okay, I'm not being funny right now. And, and you know, so you gotta be aware of, of all circumstances and all different types of people, but you'll, uh, you'll, you're better off with it than without. Honesty, obviously, if you're gonna have any sort of trust, uh, you need to make sure and be honest with your clients. I think one piece of advice I could use in having trust with you, like for example, I have that insurance trip account where I pull up my page and I show them my recommendations, all the clients that have recommended me. I show them my actual license. So they see that I'm a licensed uh, producer in the state that I'm doing business in. They see that I've got my own unique website. Um, that builds a lot of trust, shows a lot of honesty, shows the companies that I, I do business with. So if you don't have a tool, check out insurancetrip.com because it's really inexpensive for, for family first life agents anyways. But that's a great way to make sure that you're, you know, letting your clients know who you are, where your office is. It's uh, just another form of, of being legitimate inside of our business, and I'd highly, highly recommend it. Um, awareness of your body language. So, uh, you know, your gestures, your, your voice, your appearance, it, we're, we're always you know, being judged for our looks, etc. So just be aware, you know, what are you wearing? Do you look, you know, presentable? Do you have a family first life polo? Do you have a decent pair of, you know, nice shoes? Um, I, I will wear jeans, uh, nice jeans to appointments. Uh, I would go up from there if that makes sense. But um, as long as I feel pre presentable and, and confident and making sure that, you know, a lot of sales is just, the projection of and, and the transfer of enthusiasm. So how you your awareness of even your body language uh, inside of that is extremely important too. So just be aware of maybe, you know, you need to brush your teeth more or floss or I don't know, uh, breath, right? All the above uh, going into people's house because you're in close, close counters. So you don't want to turn someone off and lose a sale based off of just, you know, uh, your, your body language alone because that's, how we communicate well, more than even our, our words ourselves. The next thing it would be is uh, your proactive problem solving skills. So this will come into account where maybe someone's soup, I'll give you a good example. Maybe someone's super unhealthy, but they have a significant amount of money set aside. Well, it probably doesn't make sense to 
show them a final expense policy for 20 grand because they've got a million dollars saved away. So you need to be have be proactive and understand, okay, this is one of the sales where I'm going to pivot. So your ability to pivot to another product and, and build value in that is extremely important. We have plenty of training videos out there in regards to annuities. We have annuity section that you can, you can focus on in every single next level call as well. So your ability to pivot into another sale when, when there is an opportunity, maybe someone's doing a, doing a, uh, a full 401k, but they only get a 5% match. So the first thing you could do is maybe take the money that they're not getting a match on and look at an IUO. Those are some proactive problem-solving skills that you need to be aware of to really generate more business for, for yourself. Um, your leadership skills, you know, what example are you setting for yourself? Um, I'll be the first one to tell you that I think leadership can be very hard. Uh, I think Sean Mike does a tremendous job of using examples of you, when it comes to being a leader, you're not gonna have nine different personalities. So you're not a chameleon when you're a leader. It's a bad idea, right? But like what Doug, Sean does a really good job of is we can all relate to a part of Sean to get us motivated and moving in the right direction. That is a sign of a good leader. So good work, Sean and Mike, on that. So that those are examples of leadership skills that, you know, I'm continually working on that you need to work on because at some point, whether you're a leader in your household or you're a leader, it, leadership is going to come into play, especially if you're going to have an agency, uh, build it properly. People are going to be looking to you for results, for answers, and you need to be able to motivate them in the right way. So the next uh, thing would be just good manners. This is simple. You know, are you a person that Ask to take off your shoes when you come into a client's house. Do you say please? Do you say thank you? Um, those those people skills are are extremely important. So stuff that your mom and dad hopefully taught you, uh, or whoever you know raised you taught you hopefully. But you know having good manners, people like that. So make sure that you're you know thank you, sir, ma'am, etc. That's that's extremely important. Well, so your ability to be supportive and motivate others. Now this is more leadership uh, scenarios as well, but you know one of the most important aspects that you can be for an agent in this business is when things aren't going their way. Sometimes people just want to be heard. Meaning sometimes, sometimes now you're not a counselor. Don't don't waste time. We don't have time to be a counselor. I get it, but sometimes people need two minutes to vent. I don't know. So your ability to then get them motivated and moving in the right direction is extremely important. And, you know, talk them off the ledge, whatever. People go through sales cycles all the time. They're going to have peaks and valleys. Idea is just to stay in the middle. But we know with sales, it's extremely emotional uh, type scenario because one minute you're going to retire, the next minute you're, you're going to go hungry. So uh, unless you stay emotionally stable, then, you know, you're going to have to play some supportive roles. And, and a lot of times people want to be told that they're doing a good job, even though they might not feel like they're doing their best. So playing that role is extremely important as you start to build your agency and, and help other people get what they, they want. Um, knowing your, your audience. So knowing the right thing to, to say at the right time is extremely important. A lot of times you could kill a sale that maybe was already done by continually talking too much. So having the right time where you need to just shut up and close is extremely important. So pay attention and know, know your audience, know, you know, you might offend someone based off of their beliefs or things like that. So you got to know your audience, right? Know what to say, what not to say. Be careful of that. So out of those 20 people skills. I hope you took a few of them where you can grow on because I think it's all sales at the end of the day. I think it all helps uh, you relate to it. I'm going to go ahead and move into the top five reasons what you need to have in every single house. And I'm also going to talk to you about types of buyers next. So now that your people skills are wrapped up, I'm going to talk to you about your types of buyers that you're going to meet in the house and how to approach them and how to close them in a short time period here. The first thing is you're going to meet a lot of practical people. I'm going to make some general statements about different age groups and lump them in because there's always exceptions to every rule. I understand that. But most practical people are millennials. 
So when you meet a millennial, generally speaking, they are they want to shop. They want to look around. They, <laughs> they want to take their time in the buying decision. So how do we get someone that's practical to do business with us? They need to understand that we represent multiple A-rated insurance companies, that we're able to do the shopping for us, that you can't mark up insurance that's all regulated by the state, and then your job is to make sure the value pop, prop exceeds the price, and, and we'll future pace, we'll talk about this here in a second, but we'll future pace, and we'll be able to close uh, people as well. The next person is, and a lot of new people really struggle with this person, is the person of action. So a lot of times when you sit down with a client, they're gonna say, hey, I just want the information, give it to me right now. That's fine, I'll give it to you right now, it just takes me 10 or 15 minutes, I need three minutes to ask you some financial questions, two minutes about your health, and maybe take me 10 minutes to explain the different options to you, and we'll, we'll go through this with you. So just because they're a person of action doesn't mean that you don't do every single step in the sale. It just means that you don't have to build a lot of rapport with them. And by the way, I'm still gonna build rapport inside the financial inventory, or at least attempt to. But sometimes rapport isn't necessary to get their business. They just wanna be done. They probably sat with someone for two hours before and don't wanna do it again. So they're ready for action or get out of the house, and that's okay. So don't, don't worry about people of action. You're gonna meet plenty of them as well. The next one is you're gonna meet a lot of people that are social. Uh, these people are generally baby boomers. Uh, they like to talk. And this is where you can't be off of that rapport scenario where you're talking to people for 30 minutes about their fishing habits or their fishing hobby or their latest car collection or whatever it is. That is not rapport. So social people, you need to have a connection with them in order to close. But that's it. You don't need to get too far off track. So just understand when they're, when they're social, they want to be your friend, but you can't get too close to them because then it's too easy to tell a friend no. So you gotta stay in business with those social clients. The next thing is you're gonna meet a lot of people that are emotional. Now, I've said this in the past, but really 95% of a buying decision is emotional. So people say that they're logical, they say that they're you know, you know, know, practical, but if with, with the right type of emotion, they will buy. So generally, these are the easiest people to sell, but you can also have negative emotions towards what we're offering and positive emotions, just understand that. So make sure which, whichever direction that you're using, that you need to paint a picture in the future on how this life insurance product is gonna work for your client so they can then get emotional about it and understand they can start to accept the product. So just understand that's called the PACE system, P-A-S-E, uh, practical action, social, emotional, you're gonna meet those types of buyers. It all comes in all different shapes and sizes. Then the last thing that I'll give you today is on the certainty scale. So no one wants to buy from, from a lukewarm client, from a one to a 10. On a certainty scale, if you have a tens on all this stuff, you'll get a sale every single time with your client. So the first thing is they've gotta be 100% certain about you. I, I mentioned insurance trip, how to, how to give you certainty about you, showing them place of business, showing them, and, and show your home, by the way. It doesn't need to show, you know, show your office, your local VP office on the insurance trip, different scenarios, but they need to know that your license, the lanyard could help, right? All those different things. So make sure that they're a 10 on the certainty scale on you because they don't buy they buy from you at the end of the day more than anything else they're going to buy from you i promise that's that's how it works the next thing is your product so if you're not certain that this solution is the best for them and it doesn't come across and there's no transfer of enthusiasm and there's no real ability to get going your product's going to lay flat so when you're when you're presenting your product make sure you're a 10 on your product right Make sure you have conviction and belief, that persuasion that we talked about in a good way earlier as well. Your company. So you got two companies, right? You got Family First Life. You need to talk about how fast growing. We've done 100, over 150 million in 2018 already. We're one of the fastest growing IMOs in the country. Uh, we have thousands of agents out there just like me doing the exact same thing. And then we represent companies like Mutual of Omaha, America, et cetera, that are A-rated, been in business for over 100 years, that have a good track record on their death claim, because the only thing I care about when this is all said and done is that Mary gets a check when you die. So it's important to make sure that you build value in the company you're doing with. So if you don't talk about the company, that's another certain level, like who am I doing business with, right? So if we get a 10, 10, and 10, 
Are they going to buy? Probably not yet. So you have to have two more things. I talked about five things in the sales process as well. The last thing is you have to be, you have to go over logical certainty first. That's why we do the financial inventory first. So first a consumer needs to take on a logical solution that this is good for their family. Oh, I see. If my spouse dies, I don't have their income anymore, which is why 52% of life insurance is sold according to Limera. Um, so I, I know that I need to get this product. Oh, I see. I need to get this product because I don't want to burden my family with burial expense or any of those things like my uncle had uh, for his, for my aunt or et cetera. So making sure that you make logical sense with numbers, financial inventory is extre extremely important. So if there are 10 on the logical scale, are going to buy? Probably not. Because the last thing that you need is you need to have, make sure they have emotional certainty. So that is where, where we talk about future pacing, where you paint picture with words, where they understand how it works, where you can tell live stories. I'll give you an example on that accidental pulse. I sold those those younger clients the other day, I said, listen, I had a client, this is a real story, by the way, and you can use it. I had a client that pulled over the side of the road to text and drive, okay, with his spouse. Another car was texting and driving. This is in central Washington. Another car was texting and driving, hit that car, killed them both, accidental death on the death certificate. It paid their, their house off. So I drive around and I see people texting and driving all the time. That's a real thing. Those stories can really get someone emotional. And with the, what happens when they get emotional is now it triggers a buying experience. Now what they do when they get emotional is, is it logical? So if you didn't cover logical first, then they're not gonna, they're not gonna buy. So they'll say, they'll get emotional. They say, okay, is it logical? Oh, do I believe in you, the product, the company? Give me your driver's license. It's time to do business. Those are the five things that you need in every single, single house. I want to hope, hopefully you break that down for you and you understand how you can implement it into your business. I appreciate being on the next level call. I'm going to go ahead and pass it to our advanced market section and I'll talk to you later. Thank you. How's it going? I'm Matt Smith. Thanks for having me on the next level call on the advanced market portion. I'm going to try to keep things very simple for all of you today. I think it's important when we're talking to people about their retirement to keep it simple for them as well. The first thing that you need to understand when you're talking to your clients about some sort of potential savings or retirement investment type vehicle is what are they using the money for? Uh, there's different reasons that people have money and different reasons people need money. So that's the first question that you always need to ask someone when you sit down with them in regards to their retirement. The other thing that you need to understand is the fear of loss is two and a half times greater than the fear of gain. And you need to understand what people's motives are for money, especially when they've gone from maybe the accumulation phase of their life to more of a distribution phase of the life. Because for most of our clients that we meet, we're meeting clients that are either getting ready to retire or they are retired and they need to start looking at their money a little bit differently than when they were working and still contributing and doing that dollar cost per averaging, staying in a market, maybe can take a few more lumps and bruises along the way where now this is all the money that they have and they need to make sure that money lasts for the rest of their lives. They need to make sure they have enough of it. They need to have a strategy behind that distribution channel. And that's where as an agent, you can hang your hat and you can really have a lot of resolve and a lot of, a lot of confidence in what we do because we do it better than anyone else. So the first, first area that I would spend time on is you need to know the five retirement fears. Uh, if you've heard me train previously, we talk about this quite a bit, but I think it's important because people have different reasons for their money. So number five on the, on the scale is really not leaving a legacy to their family. So you're going to meet, meet clients that maybe they don't need the money for income, but they want to leave a legacy to their clients. Now we can also sell those individuals life insurance with that money. By the way, we could do like a single premium. I'm giving you ideas as well. Or there's plenty of legacy products out there that we can do with Family First Life that can help them make sure they leave the legacy to their loved ones when they're, they're no longer here. The fourth scenario that, that is a big fee is negative returns. 
you see this all the time where even this, this year the returns have been wiped out, where we've seen like a 10% drop just over the last month or so in the S&P 500. Well, it's kind of wiped out all the positive returns th throughout 2018. Now, they're not real negative returns until someone sells, to be clear, but however, the market is down 10%. So you're gonna see and meet a lot of clients that have a lot of fear because they're gonna start opening up their statements and all of a sudden, you know, we've been in this biggest, longest bull run in history where we've been about 10 years where things have gone really, really well for clients and they've forgotten how it was to open up their uh, envelope in 2008 or 2001 where we saw 40% cliffs. So it's important to understand that people are scared to lose money and we can put them in vehicles not to do so. And we'll talk about strategies here towards the end on, on how to approach these different accounts. Outpacing inflation. You're going to meet a lot of uh, clients that are concerned about the rise of cost of whether it's just simple food, transportation, housing, healthcare, etc. People are concerned about that inflation down the road and how it will affect their income uh, in years to come. You've got health, healthcare and long-term care costs going up. If you've noticed just over the last probably, I don't know, six years, how much has it gone up on your individual plans, right? Well, imagine when you retired and you only have this much money, how that affects your clients. That's why it's number two. And then the biggest fear for all people's retirements is outliving their money. So, you know, that, that happens a lot of times. And, and where that happens is where negative returns come into play. And we'll talk about sequence returns towards the end of this portion of the call and then we'll we'll wrap it up. So approaching it, a retirement accounts, you're gonna meet people with 401ks, traditional IRAs from previous jobs, uh, federal or state employees that have thrift savings plans or federal employee plans and people just with savings accounts. And you need to know how to approach each of those clients on, on different accounts. And the biggest thing I could tell you, if you're dealing with clients that have money, whether it's qualified funds, even non-qualified funds, um, if their money is in the market, it's important to start to talk about those bear markets that last a year and a half. The last two have been 40% gains. On average, they're at least 20% drop. So you need to future pace. You need to paint a picture world, just like for insurance that we do in the house. You need to do the same for retirement because if they don't, if it doesn't make sense, like we talked about a week before, if it doesn't make sense logically, and it doesn't make sense then emotionally, they can't back it with logic, they're not gonna do anything. So it's important, like I say, where you say, okay, here's my concern. You're 71 years old right now, John. And you know, you're know you finally retired over the last couple of years. And if we see this drop down, because it always happens, bear market usually lasts about seven years, we're well past that. If we see the market drop like it always does, and here we are taking out five, six percent of of your account value every single year. If we see your mark mark drop 20, 30 percent and you're taking out five or six percent, and that maybe happens two years in a row, what I'm concerned about is all of a sudden either your income changes dramatically because you're gonna run out of money so much quicker, or you just flat run out of money at age 82 simply because early on when you retired, the market has dropped. So th that is a real thing for more, most clients and you need to make sure to paint that picture because it's a real, real picture. It's a real fear. It's a real concern for them and you need to show them how we can create either a lifetime income or eliminate the negative returns with indexing strategies where every year when the market goes up, you lock in gains and then you start over. 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020, 2020 to 2021, now the market tanks. You have a 0% floor, so you kept all your gains plus the principal account value, and you didn't have to worry about any losses. So zero is your new hero, like Warren Buffett talks about. Number one rule of money is don't lose any, and the number two rule is remember the number one rule, right? So having those built-in automatic automation type products are very effective because a lot of times people go to to have other individuals manage their retirement but there's never a proactive approach and with these smaller accounts half a million less etc i would tell you that most advisors don't care enough 
Now there are good advisors out there, so I'm not attacking all advisors, but they're not paying attention enough to make sure that their money is protected on the downside risk. So the things that we can put them in as far as an indexing product or as far as a lifetime income product, we don't have to worry about when the downturn comes, what their money is going to look like, and we can eliminate fees. So the two things that erode your retirement accounts are negative returns and fees. So once you combine not only a negative return, but then they're paying fees and they're taking withdrawals, that's really easy to, to outlive your money or to run out of, of your funds. So that's important to understand and explain to clients. Sequence return is probably the best way to get them to open their eyes in regards to distribution. Right now, it's probably a very good time to talk to some clients back because we've got products with 8% bonuses. We've got products in some states with 10% bonuses where they can recoup all of the money that they've maybe lost this year and then start with a good, healthy spot where they can continue on and move on with their money. So that's that's extremely important too. You've got to realize when you're dealing with um, uh, someone that's above 59 and a half, so if, if they're at their current job, like, and they've started their 401k there and they're not above 59 and a half, you probably can't move that money. Okay. But if, if you can, if they're 59 and a half and above and they can do a free service inter- distribution, then you can move that money. But generally speaking, a lot of times newer agents get, get, uh, excited when you start a 401k, your current job is really difficult to move that money out. So they would have to, you know, talk to their human resource, uh, you know, department to figure out if they're even eligible to move their money out. With IRAs, you've got to think that there's one trillion orphan, or excuse me, I think there's one million, it's trillions a lot, one million orphan 401ks on on an annual basis in the United States. So when you think about people leaving their job, they've got these old 401ks at their previous job. And if you don't do a good job inside of the financial inventory, you're not going to find and locate those opportunities for you. So make sure when you're talking to people about, do you have anything that acts like life insurance, like a retirement account, it could be a 401k, IRA, et cetera. Make sure you understand, was that from a previous employer? Is that at their current job, et cetera. So that, that's extremely important as, as well, uh, for sure. Then you're going to meet people with uh, uh, TSPs and FERS. And generally speaking, all they do with these federal or state accounts is they annuitize the money. So it's very simple. We're trying to give them an apples to apples comparison to what income would be with us that they can access and not have to worry about like, we can give them survivorship options just like inside of their own TSP or, or FERS account, but we can annuitize the money just like that. So having control of your money and having lifetime income a lot of people in these accounts like that. A lot of these accounts might not be uh, huge dollar amounts because they might not work for the state or the you know the Fed for that long. So it just depends on the the client. But understand that we can do the exact same thing that will happen to their, their account. You have to be above fifty nine and a half for that in order to move that. So that's important as well. And then you're going to meet a lot of people that have money in savings and literally have money in savings because they don't want any downside risk. They've been burned in the stock market. They do remember 2001 and eight. They remember those bear markets that ripped down portfolios and they'd rather get a 1% return at the bank than have have something else. You can literally put them in some of our indexing of products with a theme, for example, where over the last 20 years, the worst 10, according to the illustration, can be right around 6%. They can get those 8%, 10% bonuses on their funds. So they can literally get eight years of their returns on a savings account simply by moving that money. Now, bonuses vest over the surrender period. They vest over time. These are all questions that can be answered inside of your CRM. You can just go to Ask a Specialist. And you'll find some amazing help there where you can find illustrations, you can find information in regards to scenarios. So if you have a scenario like a 401k, an IRA, you can put all that information into the CRM and say, what is the money for? Do they want income now? Do they want to defer the income? Are they looking to you know, outpace inflation where maybe we're doing a... Uh, fixed index annuity with a deferred income stream. So their income grows at a substantial rate over time and then they can turn it on when they need it. There's great strategies and great 
great scenarios, but you can really rely on the resources at Family First Life to help you answer some of the questions that you might be having. I just wanted to give you a quick overview on what to look for, what to talk about, and all you have to say is, hey, listen, let me come back this time next week, show you what your money will look like, show you a good illustration on what we, we can eliminate fees and negative returns, and make sure we give you income for the rest of your life. Does that sound fair? John and Mary, and they'll say, yeah, we'll take a look at it. Keep it simple, and it'll give you a lot of opportunity out there because there is plenty of opportunity here at Family First Life. Thank you for your time.